SpaceX lands a booster for the 300th time, Starliner's astronauts have arrived at the Space Coast, and NASA finally found out why Voyager 1 was speaking gibberish. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 26th of April, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week, we had six newly qualified astronauts graduating from the European Space Agency following a year of basic astronaut training. One of the six, though, is actually Australian. Australian Space Agency astronaut candidate Catherine Bennell Pegg was selected through a cooperation agreement with ESA and is Australia's first female astronaut. The other five are all European. They are Sophie Adeno from France, Pablo Alvarez Fernandez from Spain, Rosemary Coogan from the UK, Raphael Lejoie from Belgium, and Marco Sieber from Switzerland. These five were selected from 22,500 applicants to join the 17-strong class of 2022 before being selected to complete training with the remaining 12 becoming astronaut reserves, although Marcus Vaughn, one of these astronaut reserves, already flew into space on the Axiom-3 mission earlier this year, so don't think those were completely forgotten. The 12 months of training qualifies the candidates as suitable to undergo long-duration space flights for ESA. During the course, they experienced high-G centrifuges, zero-G flights, and neutral buoyancy spacewalk training in both NASA and ESA's training pools. They were also trained in the scientific methods and equipment used on the ISS to enable them to work on the station. They also took courses on human anatomy and medical techniques, navigation, survival, video and photography, and of course, rocket science. This involved learning about spacecraft systems, flight engineering, robotics, and life support systems to fully equip them for spaceflight. Now that they have their qualification, the astronauts will be assigned to future missions and will begin training on specific specialist aspects for them, building on the knowledge that they've previously gained. It's anticipated that all of them will fly to the ISS at some point, but in the future, some may also fly to the moon or to other commercial space stations in low Earth orbit. This new group of ESA astronauts has been nicknamed the Hoppers, referring to the ambition of these new astronauts to hop in low gravity on the ISS, but also on the moon. You've probably heard that NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft has had a rough few months. Back on November 14th of last year, the spacecraft suddenly and unexpectedly started to return completely unreadable data. Now, after five months, not only have the teams at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory figured out what happened to it, but they've also started to solve the issue. Once the teams noticed this problem, they quickly moved to figure out what was going on. Very early in the investigation, they discovered that the problem was with the spacecraft's Flight Data Subsystem, or FDS, which is responsible for gathering all of the data from the onboard science instruments and engineering data from the spacecraft itself before sending it back to Earth. The FDS computers in the twin Voyager spacecraft were the very first to use CMOS integrated circuits in space. The next step after finding this out was to try sending various prompts to Voyager 1 and to use any response to attempt to work out where the issue was. This process took careful planning and it was carried out over a duration of many months. Remember, the probe is a very long way from Earth, over 24 billion kilometers away in fact, so a radio signal takes almost a full day to reach Voyager and the same time again for any response to come back. Eventually, the team was able to persuade the computer to send a complete dump of its memory, and that helped to establish that one of the chips had been damaged in some way on the FDS, causing the data corruption. More intricate design and programming were then carried out to try to bypass the damaged chip, which makes up about 3% of the available memory. Remember, these computers are over 46 years old, and there's very little spare memory space to replace the code stored on the damaged chip. But the team at JPL has had over 50 years of experience with these systems, and it was eventually able to work out a solution and then send new commands and code up to Voyager 1. In order to bypass this chip and deal with the memory storage issues, the teams decided to split the new code across different parts of the FDS and adjust the code from those parts to make sure that all still worked as a whole. I guess it's a bit like Tetris, but for software. On April 18th, the team started sending the first package of code that's responsible for packaging Voyager 1's engineering data, enabling them to continue to control the probe out in interstellar space, and it wasn't until April 20th, just a few days ago, that they were able to receive proper data on the spacecraft's health and status. The success of this operation means that the team can now repeat the process to update how scientific data is processed, avoiding the broken chip. But just keep in mind how complicated all of this is nowadays. 
The two Voyager spacecraft were launched in 1977 with old technology, old code, and old systems, yet it's still kicking and flying. This is a testament to the amazing engineering, both then and now, that we can communicate with a probe that was designed and built 50 years ago, and many of the systems continue to operate and send back data from even more distant locations in interstellar space. The crew for the Starliner Crew Flight Test mission have arrived at the Kennedy Space Center. Not only that, but the mission is now go to proceed with final launch preparations. Sunita Williams and Butch Wilmore arrived at KSC on April 25th, flying on the NASA T-38 aircraft and landing at the launch and landing facility. The two crew members entered the standard quarantine ahead of launch just earlier in the week in what is a standard procedure to protect themselves and the crew of the ISS ahead of launch. At the same time, also on April 25th, NASA, Boeing, and others involved in the mission met to undergo the flight readiness review. The Flight Readiness Review is one of the last major reviews prior to launch where every part of the mission is examined with a fine-tooth comb and, if you know Starliner's past history, you know that doing this is quite a big deal. The review was completed on time and officials gave the go to proceed with final preparations ahead of launch. During a press conference after the review, officials mentioned that only minor items remain open ahead of launch, which will be worked out before the launch readiness review that's set to occur much closer to launch. The preparations for launch will involve a mission dress rehearsal, which should be happening on the day of this publication. During this mission dress rehearsal, the crew will suit up and head out to the pad, mimicking launch day operations, getting into their spacesuits, and conducting final pad training before the launch. That launch is currently set to take place on May 7th at 2.34 UTC, with docking of the spacecraft to the ISS Harmony module planned to occur on May 8th at 5.11 UTC. And you can definitely count on us to follow along as a new spacecraft joins the very short list of spacecraft that can carry humans into orbit. Here's hoping for the best for Sunny and Butch. NASA's Artemis program is currently aiming to land astronauts on the moon in 2026. We already know that the SpaceX and Blue Origin designs for the human landing system are underway, and this week, news broke that NASA has now requested the two companies to begin design work for the cargo landing craft variants that will enable heavy equipment to be delivered to the moon. Both Blue Origin and SpaceX teams have been tasked by NASA to adapt the designs of their human landing system craft to provide cargo landing capability, negating the need to start from scratch on new designs. Lunar astronauts will require support equipment to be landed for their missions, including the pressurized rover that NASA and Artemis partner JAXA, the Japanese space agency, have recently commissioned. The cargo landers will be visually similar to their human lander versions, but they obviously won't have life support or other human requirements built in. Instead, they will have enhanced unloading and equipment deployment capabilities. Each lander will have the potential of delivering up to 15 tons of cargo to the surface of the moon and could play a vital role in any future moon-based projects. Early renders show SpaceX's Starship-based lander using a crane integrated into the large payload door, lowering a pressurized rover onto the moon's surface. The render even suggests a further two have already been unloaded. In the render showing the Blue Origin design, the lander appears to be lifting a single rover out of the top of the craft in a cradle before swinging it down onto the lunar surface. They're interesting design choices that, for now, are of course only renders, so it might take a while for us to see them being used. Under this new task order, the new cargo landers wouldn't be used until at least the Artemis 7 mission, but knowing both SpaceX and Blue Origin, we're probably going to be seeing some early prototypes a lot sooner than that. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Slim, Jax's lunar lander, has woken up again on the moon. Wait, is this the right script for this week? <laughs> well, it turns out, yeah. The Japanese lunar lander has started up once again after enduring yet another cold night on the lunar surface. This is now the third lunar night that it survived, and yet somehow it's still working. It's almost getting repetitive now to see such success out of a little lander. Teams are taking advantage of this though and continue to monitor the health of the lander, gathering science and engineering data from it as long as it continues to wake up every lunar day. This will certainly be of help for JAXA for any potential future landers that it may build, but even if not, this is kind of like JPL saying, oh, it'll just last a few days, just a few missions, and then it turns out it lasts for years. It's wild. Saxivord has announced that it's received a range license from the UK Civil Aviation Authority, meaning that it is now able to manage its own launches by clearing the areas around and downrange of its spaceport. 
Located in the Shetland Islands, Saxavord officially became a spaceport just a few months ago when the CAA also granted a spaceport license, allowing it to host up to 30 launches per year. All of this means that it just needs to have a rocket within it that's also licensed to launch from there, and, well, that might be happening right now. Rocket Factory Augsburg announced this week that it had shipped the first stage of its RFA-1 rocket to Saxavord. This first stage is now vertical at its future launch pad, which for now will be used as a test stand, allowing the company to test fire the first stage ahead of flight. RFA is hoping to fly from Saxavord in the late summer, but chances are it could still delay into the fall as the company puts its first rocket through its paces. Now let's go over all of the traffic in space by taking a look at This Week in Launches and Next Week in Space Flight. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Changzheng 2D on April 20th at 2345 UTC from Launch Complex 3 at the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying the Yaogan 4202 satellite into low Earth orbit. Yaogan is a Chinese military remote sensing satellite program used for classified military missions that are likely reconnaissance based. This launch has come under three weeks after the first Yaogan 4201 launch and has been the fourth flight of the Changzheng 2D since March 21st. The cadence of China's space program is extremely promising and continues to challenge the rest of the world to continue advancing spaceflight worldwide. The 300th landing of an orbital booster has officially been achieved. Falcon 9 completed its 41st launch of 2024 in spectacular fashion, taking more Starlink satellites to orbit and well, it does happen all the time, but this time it broke a record. Liftoff took place from Space Launch Complex 40 on April 23rd at 2217 UTC. This mission, Starlink Group 653, was carrying 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. This was B-1078's ninth flight, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions, completing the 300th successful landing of a Falcon booster. This number counts the landings of Falcon 9 boosters and Falcon Heavy boosters as well. While this was the 300th landing, there were at least another 11 landing attempts that did not go so well, so overall this was actually the 311th landing attempt for a Falcon booster. But when you look at it all, it's actually incredible that only 11 landing attempts have failed, and in fact, SpaceX has had 226 successful booster landings since the last landing failure, all the way back in February 2021. SpaceX's crazy cadence means that over the one year that we've been publishing This Week in Spaceflight episodes, we've already covered the 200th and now 300th successful landing. At this current cadence, don't be surprised if we end up covering the 400th landing right before the end of the year. With this launch, SpaceX has now sent 6,281 Starlink satellites into orbit, of which 407 satellites have re-entered and 5,214 are now in their operational orbit. Just 15 minutes after this launch, we had an Electron rocket launching from Rocket Lab's own commercial spaceport in Mahia, New Zealand. Liftoff of the company's Beginning of the Swarm mission took place on April 23rd at 2232 UTC, carrying the NEONSAT-1 and ACS-3 spacecraft into sun-synchronous orbit. NEONSAT-1 is a high-resolution optical satellite developed by the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology that's slated to be used as a technology demonstration for a larger constellation of optical satellites and set to begin operation in 2026. This satellite will overlook the Korean Peninsula, spotting natural disasters and military activity. The second payload on this flight, ACS-3, is a NASA technology demonstration satellite that will test new composite materials. This CubeSat will have lightweight composite booms that extend to support a solar sail. If NASA can confidently prove that using these materials for the sail will work, it could lead to future larger scale designs using similar materials to cut down on non-essential mass. Doing this could increase the efficiency of what could be able to fly on smaller launchers, saving costs for the entire industry. Closing out the week, yesterday we had the launch of another crew rotation mission to the Tiangong Space Station. Launch of the Shenzhou-18 spacecraft atop its Changzhang 2 fg rocket took place on April 25th at 12.59 UTC from South Launch Site 1 at the Zhouchuan Satellite Launch Center. On board Shenzhou-18 was Commander Ye Guangfu, who is making his second trip to space during this mission. His crewmates, Li Tsong and Li Guangsu, are rookies and this is their first flight into space. Shenzhou-18 docked to the Nader docking port of the Tianha module about four orbits after launch on April 25th at 1932 UTC. 
The Shenzhou 18 Taikonauts will now take over the station from the Shenzhou 17 ones and stay on the orbiting outpost for six months. The crew will be performing dozens of science experiments and are expected to perform between two to three spacewalks to upgrade the station's external systems. Now, going into next week, we'll have the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket carrying a pair of European Galileo Global Positioning satellites. Liftoff is set to take place from Launch Complex 39A within a roughly 30-minute window that opens on April 28th at 34 minutes past midnight UTC. This flight is expected to use veteran booster B-1060 on its 20th flight. It's also expected to be its last flight, as documentation for this mission indicates that this flight will see the booster being expended for it. Also next week, we'll have the return of the SpaceX CRS-30 Dragon spacecraft. This return is subject to weather, which has already delayed it by two days and could still keep it from happening for even a few more. As of recording, undocking of Dragon from the Zenith port of the ISS Harmony module is set to take place on April 28th at 17.05 UTC. Deorbit, re-entry, and splashdown of the capsule would then take place several hours later off the coast of Florida. Then from Florida, we'll have the launch of a Falcon 9 carrying another batch of Starlink satellites. The four-hour launch window for the Starlink Group 654 mission is set to open on April 28th at 21.50 UTC. With the Shenzhou 18 crew now at the Tiangong Space Station, it's time for the Shenzhou 17 crew to return back to Earth. That return is currently set to happen on April 30th, and while we don't know the exact time for undocking, the landing should take place at 9.40 UTC in the Gobi Desert. It's certainly a space station week because also on April 30th, we'll have the relocation of the Crew-8 Dragon spacecraft on the ISS. The spacecraft is set to undock at 11.45 UTC from the front docking port of the Harmony module and redock to the Zenith port less than 45 minutes later at 12.28. This relocation will leave the front docking port of the station free for Starliner to dock to it during its crew flight test in a couple of weeks from now. Next week, we'll also be keeping an eye on a Falcon 9 set to launch from the U.S. West Coast. The mission is carrying the first two Worldview satellites for Maxar, but for some reason that hasn't been made public yet, the launch has been delayed several times. It's now expected to take place in the last few days of April during a two-hour window set to open at 1830 UTC. Then, opening up the month of May, we'll have another Falcon 9 with another batch of Starlink satellites. The four-hour launch window is set to open on May 2nd at 1.43 UTC. And to wrap up the week, and right before our next This Week in Space Flight episode, we'll have the launch of a Changzheng 5 from Wenchang carrying the Chang'e 6 lunar sample return mission. The six-hour launch window is set to open on May 3rd at 7 o'clock UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Space Flight.